I hope you're ready for some ill logic. Last time we went over week one of the Wooper Club League and our battle against Steve Chuck and the Waterdeep Wobbuffets. Please go check that out first if you have not done so already as I went over the team builder as well as the battle which, spoiler alert, the Buffalo Buffalo emerged victorious with a clean 3-0 win to bring our overall record to 1-0. and This week, as you've probably already guessed, we are taking on the 0-1 Akron Agrons, coached by Joey, a.k.a. Joe8. Joey is a good friend of mine, and if he were not still hosting our annual New Year's party, I probably would not have been invited into the Whooper Club League at all. So a big thank you to Joey for hosting and putting up with us every year. As always, we'll be starting off with a team builder, followed by the battle and some post-game interview stuff. Timestamps will be in the description. His team is pretty interesting and filled with some very scary mons. He has Arena Trap Doug Trio to lead things off in the speed tiers, Espeon, Gengar, Excadrill, which I am terrified of, Togekiss, his Dynamax targets of Flareon, Roselia, and Marini, all three of those, and rounding things out with Araquanid and Avalug. Like last time, I'll be saving some of the biggest team threats for later on and go over everything from what I think is least likely to come up to most likely. Marini is a pretty cool pick, and he did bring it last week as his Dynamax target, but I have so many ways to deal with this thing that I do find it ultimately unlikely to come, even with the possibility of Toxic Spikes. Speaking of which, it's a similar story for Roselia, but it at least has some more utility with Sleep Powder affecting all but Celebi, who is weak to its other stab. This mod could be way scarier too if I don't bring Celebi, but that may have to be the sacrifice I end up making. Surprisingly, I'm not that concerned about Gengar, even with its speed stat so high, as it really doesn't do much better than Espeon does, and they kind of double up in, in many ways. I can play around the Gengar a lot better. A stalling Gengar set with Substitute could be pretty annoying, but I'm not really anticipating that. Finally, I think maybe the Togekiss doesn't have the best matchup here. I have three Pokemon faster than it with super effective stab, as well as a couple other amazing answers below that speed range. Just avoid a flinch once and I should be set, or use it as an opportunity to do other things. Now to move on the sixth I think he'll bring, Doug Trio obviously needs to be talked about, as it warps team building around it in a way that nothing else really does. I need to have options like Air Balloon and Shed Shell available to me to make sure he doesn't pick off my team one at a time. That being said, I do think I have a few good or great answers to it, including three mods he doesn't trap, along with others that outspeed it or hit it multiple times break through Sash. Flareon should definitely be the Dynamax of choice for him, as an answer to cure on Black, among other things. Max Flare into Max Flare, for example, KOs my entire team, meaning I really don't actually have a switch into it, and it's making me a little concerned about my apparent fire weakness in the future. Araquanid makes a lot of sense to me here too, as well, uh, considering webs make it even more difficult for my team that is mostly grounded and or susceptible to a certain Mold Breaker mod, as well as being overall tanky and easy to deal damage with due to Water Bubble. Espeon is next, as a well-played early game Espeon can bounce back rocks or absolutely punch a hole through my team, especially considering the team I am bringing this week, it's a little rough. Avalog poses a bit of a problem too, as all the physical attackers I'm bringing this week, including Kiron Black, are completely stonewalled by this behemoth iceberg. Boots plus recover with a side of body press does not make a fun time for me. And finally, yes, the one and only Excadrill. An old breaker is a huge problem for my team, as I have an aversion to flying types, so my only Pokemon off the ground are Rotom and Weezing, Levitators, which have their abilities ignored and are weak to Earthquake. My resists then include Excelgor, which seriously doesn't count, and Celebi, for which he can easily run Excisor. Neither of them would be able to outspeed anyways if he rapid spins on the switch. So yeah, this thing can plow through my team with relative ease with something like Earthquake Art, Head Excisor, and maybe Rapid Spin or Sword Stance. Not really looking forward to dealing with that, but we do have a few options. So let's start off with the mods that aren't coming this week. Excelva really doesn't do that much aside from hitting Espeon, which could easily bring a Scarf or a Sash anyways. Spikes can be reflected or removed easily, and I really don't like the idea of bringing Final Gambit more often than I need to, especially considering the nature of this matchup, which I'll get into in a little bit. Alolan Dugtrue has some use, but ultimately did not make the cut because the other tier 5 here is godly. Dougie is also sped outsped by his Cantonian counterpart, and could be stopped in its tracks by something like Araquanid anyways. Scrafty actually ha does have a pretty decent matchup here, but I was a little scared to bring in a matchup against things like Togekiss, Espeon, and Gengar that could outspeed it and hit it with fairy coverage. Not the worst, but certainly there are some better options. And finally, I decided to leave Celebi behind as well this week, despite my top speed tier going down and down. Besides, between the three poison types, a Dynamax Flare uh, from Flareon, the certainty of things like Araquanid to come, as well as Avalok, Dugtrio outspeeding me, Excadrill Excisor, it just seemed to be a bit too much for me. However, I am quite pleased with the six I am bringing, so let's get over to the team builder. So, 
The name of the game here is going to be Sweeping, and to help facilitate that, I'm going to be starting off with the setup for the setup before getting into the breakers and sweepers themselves. So starting off, Seismitoad is making its debut for the team here in Week 2 with a relatively standard set. None of Toad's um, switch-ins like taking a knock off this match, and should be able to KO Espeon or Gengar after rocks with the investment. The attack investment also allows Earthquake to always one-hit KO Excadrill, Oko Dugtrio most of the time, and two-hit KO Offensive Flareon even after it's Dynamaxed. Toxic can cripple a switch in like Togekiss or Araquanid, with rocks obviously breaking sashes and providing good chip to many members weak to rocks, such as the aforementioned Araquanid and Togekiss. Defensively, I have enough HP and defense to survive two Jelly Earthquakes from Excadrill, and the Rindo barriers for a random grass move from something like Gengar or Espeon that let me knock them off or just straight KO them to open the door for my rocks. And of course, Water Absorb helps me wall Araquanid in particular. I find this to be the center glue piece of the team as we got into more dedicated setup, and with that we're going to start off with a dual screens Volt Switch Overheat Rotom Heat with Light Clay. This one is absolutely crucial typing for things like Flareon and especially Togekiss, which it hard stone walls, which the EVs allow me to outspeed without Scarf. The idea is simple. Set up screens, Volt Switch out or just die, bring in a sweeper. But imagine getting screens off twice. Overheat is nice to one hit KO Excadrill on a switch, as I'm still okayed by, by Earthquake even through Reflect, and an Overheat should also be able to one hit KO Avalog, although Sturdy could activate as well. It's straightforward and simple, but it's very different from last week's set, so I hope that I can start to catch people off guard. Speaking of different from last week, this time we're going to be running uh, Weezing Galarian Form. It was a fun set to put together, and I'm very glad to be able to run Neutralizing Gas this week. I guess we should start off with that and go over the relevancy of this ability. Uh, it negates Dugtrio's Arena Trap, so even though I am grounded, I still get out fine. It negates Espeon's Magic Bounce, so I can it can still get burnt or taunted on a switch-in. It negates Guts on Flareon, so non-facade moves should be able to do less damage. It negates Regenerator, so Marini can't switch around and heal quite as easily. It even negates Water Bubble, so Araquanid should be doing way less damage. And finally, maybe the most important part, it negates Toxic Spikes. As I'm not floating off the ground this week, it can absorb Toxic Spikes coming from one of two possible setters he has, even if I don't think they're as likely to come. I have a bunch of special defense investment as to take a hit from fast special attackers, especially Psychic from Espeon, as I am holding a Pyapa Berry, and then I should be able to follow up with a couple of moves. Plus, I have enough speed for No Speed Flareon or Rosalia. Defog is for Sticky Web in particular. Will-O-Wisp cripples multiple members, if I can predict correctly. Taunt can shut down things like webs from coming up in the first place. And Memento is the fun spicy pick that can help with one of my sweepers to help them set up basically for free. The idea, of course, is to cripple something with a burn and switch around to get set up on that, or just put something at minus two with a well-timed memento. Pretty easy to get, I hope, especially as we see some of the things that we're going to be setting up for, starting off with an Air Balloon Aegislash with Sword Stance, Shadow Sneak, Iron Head, and Close Combat. Again, EV to outspeed, no speed, Flareon, and Roselia. The balloon means that Excadrill and Dugtrio have a hard time touching me at all and give me a possible chance to set up. Plus two, Shadow Sneak, one Adamant, Oko's Dugtrio, Espeon, and Gengar. Exodrill takes 63 to 75, Togekiss over half, and Araquanid just about the same. Ironhead also KOs Togekiss straight out, and Close Combat should hit and KO the Excadrill this thing is meant to beat. I considered Psycho Cut for a little bit, that was a cool option here for the poison types, but ultimately decided these were the Pokemon that I needed to be able to beat. This thing can also be used early game pretty easily against Excadrill, as it can provide a free switch in and be very hard to stop with the air balloon still intact. I will of course need to be careful, but the reward could be huge. Next up we have another sweeper on the physical side, and that's going to be Dragon Dance Kieran Black, with enough speed for Jolly Excadrill and heavy duty boots for possible webs or rocks should they get up. After a Dragon Dance Fusion Bolt one hit KOs, Gengar, Espeon, Togekiss, and Araquanid, with Marini taking 85 to 100. Icicle Spear also one hit KOs Dugtrio through the Focus Ash, as well as Excadrill and Dynamax to Rosalia if it hits just three times. If you hadn't noticed, that is almost his entire team in two moves, with the only exceptions being Flareon and Avalug. Flash Cannon is the tech move here, as it two hit KOs physically defensive Avalug, which I expect to come, with ease. Even with zero investment and a minus special attack nature, it's still going to do enough damage to two hit KO. So really the only true check to this thing is the Flareon and one of the biggest reasons why I'm so worried about it. Also at plus one speed, the only things outspeeding me are Scarfed, Espeon, Gengar, and Dugtrio. And its speed isn't lowered by webs because of boots. 
So if you thought these calcs were crazy, wait till you see the last member on the team, Kingler, making its debut. And oh boy, does this thing have an amazing, amazing matchup. Double Dance does seem a bit greedy, but of course I do have ways to protect it on the team with things like uh, screens as well as Memento. And it also has a Lumberry, which is holding on to to stop burns and poison should someone decide that that is the way to stop it. After an agility, a single agility, I even outspeed Scarf, Gengar, and Espeon, which means with webs up, they need to be Scarfed to outspeed. If I get an SD up, it's basically over, along with the agility. It's so strong, even outside of Dynamax, that I can agility on a switch to something fast, KO it without Dynamaxing, and be able to set up Sword Stance afterwards on something slower. Roselia can survive a Dynamax hit at plus two, but if I go for Max Quake, I get, a def I get the special defense boost, lets me tank the incoming hit, and KO the next turn. Or I can max Geyser to get the rain and two hit KO based on the rain. Havelock is a similar story. Two hit KO'd as I get up the rain in Dynamax form, and Araquan is straight up two hit KO'd by Liquidation. Again, he really doesn't have any answers here, especially as you consider the setup opportunities. Even a regular X Girl that isn't burnt, mementoed, or hitting a Kingler behind Reflect, just straight up Excadrill versus Kingler, the Excadrill is only doing 57 to 68% to me, which to me sounds like a free agility. Kingler has so many chances to set up, so long as I don't blow it, Kingler can win the match with ease. So with that being said, let's take a look at what happened in the actual match. So, first off, I'm a bit relieved to see no Espeon. I also identify Flareon as the Dynamax member of choice, and otherwise not terribly surprised to see anything that is here. I can't really afford something like Weezing or Rotom to lead against the drill, so I'm just going to go ahead and lead with... Um, nice Seismitoad. Again, I don't want Excador to come in for free onto something that I can just destroy. And this also gives me a chance to possibly set up. He has a similar idea with the Araquanid, and we also decided that perhaps exchanging po poisons was more important than getting up our hazards first, as those do come next. So now, he does reveal leftovers as well, which is interesting because I'm not recovering at the same rate that he is. But also interesting that I, I feel like I kind of misplayed here just a little bit. I wonder if perhaps I should not have gone over uh, to uh, my Weezing so soon here. Uh, I feel like I was prioritizing just a little bit getting rid of the hazards here. He does reveal Giga Drain, which is a cool tech, and also tells me maybe he didn't have the coverage for Celebi. But I, I do wonder why I decided that defogging here was so important. Uh, without seeing the Espeon or the Gengar here, I don't really need the agility to outspeed that much. It may be necessary for the Doug Trio, but even then, uh, agility from Kingler will still do fine. I'm not affected by it with the Kyurem. Age of Slash doesn't really need that speed anyways. I, I'm not really sure why I was doing that. Plus, this seems like a relatively obvious switch into the Excadrill, so I also had an opportunity that I missed here to Will-O-Wisp. And again, I'm not really sure why I decided to go for Defog. He could have even been coming into Rapid Spin. So this seems like just a bad play on my part, especially because, as I just mentioned at the beginning of the match, this is the exact situation that I wanted to avoid. I don't want to see Excadrill in on Weezing or Rotom. So now I have to make this switch out into my Toxic Seismitoad, who's going to take a clean 40% from that. Maybe a little bit less than I expected, but it's enough, obviously, for the 2 at KO. I uh, kind of wanted to see maybe what the damage was going to be like, see if maybe I could get a favorable roll or something, but ultimately this was just to kind of sack it off as he goes into Araquanid on the very easy Earthquake prediction, or even a water move, Araquanid was just the safe switch. So I'm going to find myself kind of again in the same mess as before for some reason by going into Weezing and once again not making the easy prediction and just clicking Defog. So now I'm in the same spot and... I make yet another misplay on top of that. My, my Seismitoad is so weakened, and there's not really going to be another opportunity to get up those rocks because it's so weakened, so I probably should have just gone into him. However, I know that it's a roll to KO the Weezing from this range, which he does get. Uh, it was not in my favor in the first place, so it wasn't like it was hacks or anything. So, in this situation, down 5-6, to six, seeing that I'm not having that many opportunities to set up, I need to be able to put on a little pressure. I need to be able to get a little bit of damage on this Excadrill, considering that I've already missed multiple chances to burn it or do anything to it at all in the first place. At least there are no webs, but again, that doesn't matter all that much. So in comes the Aegis Slash. I need to get damage on it. He may be a little, little weary because of the balloon, and he is able to get yet another easy switch in on the incoming close combat. 
Um, I, I decide to make kind of a bold play here as he doubles out into Togekiss and Sword Stance up. Not really sure what he was going to do there, but I'm able to switch out into Rotom as he reveals an interesting tech in Substitute. Uh, this could be pretty bad, but I know that this thing walls Togekiss super well, so I don't really have any qualms about just setting up a light screen here, and he goes for a wish. So this is an interesting turn here too, considering he's behind a substitute, he has leftovers, he has wish, I have to kind of figure out what exactly he's going for. He could obviously go to the Araquanid, but he probably doesn't want to or can't eat a Volt Switch from me. I decide I don't want to overpredict anything if he goes to, say, like, a, a Excadrill for free. I'm just going to get up my Reflect, try to set up for future turns, and I am rewarded for this as well, getting the Reflect up and eating up the Thunder Wave. He was expecting something else to come in, I suppose, and I don't have to worry about that at all. So now I have an interesting decision to make here. Obviously, I need to get rid of the Substitute by using Volt Switch, but now I need to figure out what I go into. I figure the thing with the best chance to one-shot it, even through Substitute, if it decides to Substitute again, would be to Kiram. It would really suck to have that thing paralyzed with Thunder Wave, but I think that's a risk I just kind of have to take here and go into Kiram as he just wishes again. Uh, again, I need to try, try to one-hit KO that thing. He makes the easy switch out into Avalug, and I am still relatively safe behind screens here. So he may not know about my tech of Flash Cannon seeing the Icicle Spear, so I think, well, if he uses the Body Press, it two-hit KOs when I'm not behind Reflect, so it should do worse than that. I only need to set up one Dragon, and it's really sweep, so I'm going to get that up now, and then Flash Cannon twice, as he's not going to be able to recover. However, he reveals the tech Roar, which does still set up the most important turn of the game, because it brings in my Kingler for absolutely free. So this is a similar situation where he could just kind of continuously roar, right? But I want to try to get significant damage off on him, if any at all. So I decide I need to go for a Sword Stance this first turn. Uh, this was a positive in multiple ways here, because if he stays in and, and just roars, I don't really lose anything. If he stays in and attacks, I'm not going to be taking much of anything. If he stays in Toxics, I don't care that much. I have a Lumberry. And if he switches, which he did, then that's an amazing opportunity to set up even more. And it gets even better, as we can see, he's going to, uh, after I get the agility up, he's going to go for a Toxic, which is, again, negated by the Lumberry. And I am exactly where I need to be. One final misplay for the game here, as I Dynamax a little bit early, even max defense Araquanid will take 40% from just straight up liquidation, but ever eager, I kind of jumped the gun a little bit, and it's Dynamax time at plus two attack, plus two speed. We're kind of off to the race a little bit. Avalog, of course, is a decent answer as he protects. Uh, max guys are hitting through that, will do 21% because of the rain. Failing to get the double protect, that 52% chance was crucial as uh, you do the remaining 79% of its health. Doesn't get to use it for sturdy, doesn't get to use it to block my Kyurem. Avalog is gone. Two of his biggest checks to this thing are gone. And if we weren't off to the races before, oh boy are we now. Um, this was perhaps the biggest misplay of, of his part too, as we see the, the Dugtrio finally coming in. I wonder if he maybe overestimated the damage that Dugtrio would be able to do outside of Dynamax. But this thing, I already know, has a Sash, as we see is revealed here by this liquidation. So the Sash could have wasted a couple turns of my Dynamax. And with that, Avalog could be at full health. Once this thing is out of Dynamax, I do not want to hit KO with liquidation. It is still, I believe, a 2 at KO uh, while well, in the rain, but Avalog would have had a chance to roar this out. Uh, as it is, though, I just activate the Focus Sash on Dugtrio Earthquake. As you can see, it only does 48% because Kingler is pretty thick, apparently. Uh, from here, it's pretty straightforward. Liquidation, uh, four times, one in the rain with a crit to KO the Togekiss. This is really interesting that the Flareon Dynamaxes, and I still outspeed and get the one-hit KO. Uh, Sucker Punch doing a little bit of pitiful damage there. And clicking Liquidation one more time will give... Kingler, all six kills, and a 5-0 win uh, overall. So GG to my opponent, Joey. Uh, things could have been a lot different there had, for example, I not gotten lucky with the switch on the roar. Uh, I saw he had a lot of anti-sweeping measures in place. I think the Kingler just, the calcs were that nutty, however much I misplayed. The Lumberry was an excellent choice as well. Uh, I could have played better, but Kingler really coming through here, uh, putting me on, on its back. 
So hopefully the rest of the league is on notice for how busted this thing is, as well as Dynamaxing in general. But Kingler will now shoot up to second place among kill leaders, tied with Charizard and just behind the Kyurem. Do not be sleeping on Kingler. So finally, let's wrap things up with an interview with my opponent, Joey. All right, so here we are with the post-game interview with Joey, or Joe 8. How are you doing, good sir? I'm um, doing all right. Could be doing a bit better if I, I understand. Want to know. <laughs> sure. Uh, Coach the Akron Agrons here. So just going over the teams a little bit, see what he brought. So I'll try to get some insight into his thought process, processes here with the Doug Trotokis, Excadrill, Flareon, Araquanid, and Avalog. So for those of you who don't know, Joey uh, has a bit of a reputation <laughs> for getting swept in this league. And I think we both acknowledge that in the team building process. Uh, I, as you saw earlier, I brought a bunch of different sweepers, and Joey, you had a ton of different ways to combat sweeping. Uh, could talk to me about a little bit about the thought process that's there. Uh, yeah. So Avalog was my primary anti-sweep measure. Mm -hmm. uh, had Sturdy, so it could not be one-shot. Heavy-duty boots to make sure Sturdy, sturdy wouldn't get broken, mm -hmm. and then Roar. Right. So ideally, if something else got knocked out first, I'd just send him out, then Roar. And a lot of my necessary. sweepers were physically anyways, too, and this thing right. is just an absolute physical So he probably wouldn't wall. even need the sturdy. Mm -hmm. uh, he also had protect so that you could just buy a bit of time if yeah, it wasn't stall out a little bit, right. right. Um, I do my like that other, Yeah. My other main anti-sweep measure was uh, Flareon with a max HP investment and Dynamax mm. capability with a red card. Yeah, I like, yeah, like that red card. Didn't get to see it, but that's nice. Yeah, didn't get to see it because... Uh, oh, and the heal bell. I didn't even notice that. That's really good. Yep. Oh, jeez. Okay, yeah, because yeah, those walls need to be intact, the Araquanid and the uh, Avalog, in order to, to stop that sweeping as well. Yes. Dang, okay. And maybe the best way to break through Togekiss could have been Toxic. And, okay, I like that a lot, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. That's an interesting Togekiss set. I, I, I like that a lot, the Substitute Wish, uh, along with Thunder Wave. That's really interesting. Talk right. about that. It was... I, I normally you'd use a Scarf Togekiss, but mm -hmm. I decided... Uh, I, I am so it, sick of losing to Scarf Togekiss, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Thunder Wave. That's. Uh, <laughs> if you can, can you really find a better way to stop sweepers than Thunder Wave? Jeez. Exactly. Thunder right. Wave Air Slash. That that stops them. <laughs> <laughs> and Wish again, along with Heal Bell, Heal up the T. That's. Uh, that, that's pretty darn good. I I like that a lot. I just <laughs> got up the SD with with Kingler. Just kind of lucky chance that I got roared into the Kingler. I think uh, overall yep. really did it. Uh, the Focus uh, Session Doug Trio was definitely uh, definitely scared of too for stopping the sweep, but. Exactly. Unfortunately, did not do enough damage to the Kingler. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, that was what a lot of the calcs were, were built around was I noticed that Excadrill and uh, Tugtrio did not one-shot it. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, I'm a little surprised, too. I, I also EV'd it so that after an agility would outspeed the Scarf, Espeon, and Gengar, neither of which I see here. Um, they fulfill similar, somewhat similar roles. I was a little worried about the Espeon, too, in case you tried to set up Hazard, but I see if plenty of hazard control on your own there too. Uh, any reason why I didn't decide not to bring uh, either of those two? Uh, let's see... I don't think there was any big thought process going into that. Mm -hmm. It's more of just I only had so many slots I didn't really feel like putting them in the slots this time. That's right. Everything else seems kind of necessary and maybe not having something so liable to the Aegis Slash there, right? Right. And I also noticed you know, that uh, none, neither of the other tier fives on your team made it, the Roselia or the uh, Marini. Yep. I know you'll we'll get a lot of different options, had, but... Yeah, I originally had the Roselia instead of Flareon, mm -hmm. but then I decided to not put Heal Bell on Togekiss, so I wanted Flareon. And, well, wait, was that why I decided that? I don't actually remember. I remember I swapped Flareon for Roselia. Okay. But that probably wasn't the reason, because Roselia also has... Uh, the cleric option. Right, I, I was definitely scared of the sleep powder. I didn't actually really bring anything for that, <laughs> aside from the lumber. But <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I do think these were probably the right six to bring them, nonetheless. Um, quick attack on Flareon's interesting too. I wonder if you're like worried about a scarf or just like couldn't quite finish something uh, it, off. It, it's a priority option. Flareon doesn't have a great move pool, so uh, it, as it was, shown by the nickname, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh my goodness! So yeah, uh, it was just a move that had some utility. Mm -hmm. uh, so what? 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 Into I see like one... the Araquanid set has Sticky Web, 
Uh, obviously a fantastic option, and then the other couple moves, uh, Scald and Giga Drain for special coverage, and then a Toxic too. That, that act does seem to put in a decent amount of work. Anything else uh, in that thought process? Yeah. How much Sticky Web would help? Uh, the Araquanid I, specific right. the Araquanid I specifically did special because I wanted Giga Drain for dealing with mm. uh, Seismitoad. Sure. Because I figured my team would have trouble dealing with that. Right, that does wallet otherwise. Toxic, obviously, <laughs> was not great on it, but... Yeah. <laughs> sure, okay. Okay, yeah, I mean, Different circumstances, you're roaring something else, I never get a chance to set up anything, and it, we're talking mm -hmm. an entirely different game. Like, I, I couldn't avoid... Excadrill, I thought, was the biggest issue, by far, in team building. Um, I... See, I seem to have an aversion to drafting flying types, so my only <laughs> my only things off the ground were levitators, which it doesn't care about. Exactly. And it obviously outspeeds them too, so I was a little worried though too seeing that leftovers thought maybe like a substitute was coming out and you know, I was a little hesitant to go into into any sweepers or anything there. But uh yeah, leftovers still still somewhat standard, but <laughs> it doesn't need to do much else to run havoc over my team. Um, right. So any, any closing thoughts, anything else aside from uh Aside from the roar and a Kingler, that maybe had gone differently. <laughs> uh, that about covers all the thoughts I had going into my team. Yeah. All right, I definitely, definitely appreciate it. Uh, so, Akron Agron's starting off a little bit rough, but I can see that your mind's at the right place. You're starting to adapt very quickly, and a lot of incredibly scary threats at that. I look forward to see what you do with the rest of the season. So thank you very much for, for being on here. Uh, yeah. Next week we've got the Close Combat Club and Hitmonjohn, but that'll do it for now. See ya. Yep, see you.